move on to the current state and what companies are doing with ESG reporting and disclosure. Kate, I'm gonna start with you. How is Marsh McLennan approaching its ESG reporting? I would say that it's been an evolution at Marsh McLennan. Um, we we started as as Mark was referring to the alphabet soup. You know, we started reporting carbon emissions under the GRI, the the um, Global Reporting Initiative, uh, all the way back to 2010. And uh, last year, our our company made the decision, and our CEO announced that we would be reporting under the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. Um, and as we got into looking at what that report would look like and looking at the report that we had, um, which we had called our citizenship report, which was the GRI reporting mixed with a little bit of social uh, elements, uh, we decided that it would make sense to integrate all of those elements. So what was before an environmental report um, and a social report, and of course our proxy statement um, as our governance report, we've decided to pull all of the elements together into an integrated report. And um, it's been a challenge, I have to say. We, we were challenged by our executive committee to be in the vanguard of ESG reporting. And so we said, what does that mean? There's no commonly accepted framework. So what we did is we took all of those things. We took the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We took the TCFD framework. We took the SASB recommendations. We took GRI. And we listed out every disclosure item that all of those frameworks and standards would want to see. And um, we used that as our initial outline. And we, we paired back from there. It's voluntary today. So we said there's some things that we're not quite ready to report. There's some things we didn't think were necessarily relevant to the stakeholders who will be looking at this report. But that's where we started. We started with that massive outline. We've paired it back. And we actually, on March 31st, just published our first integrated ESG report. And what we did is in the back, we included an index to cross-reference all three of those um, for GRI, SASB, and TCFD, so that anyone who is following any of those specific frameworks can then see where we've reported. Um, and we can kind of hold ourselves accountable to those standards. It is an evolution, though, and I think over time, there may be a unified model, but um, we, we will be enhancing and we'll be adding disclosure to that. Uh, one thing we said when we put in our first disclosure is once you report it, you can't go back. And so we wanted to make sure that we um, were committed to putting out uh, the disclosure that, that was in that first report on an ongoing basis going forward. Well, that, that's a great example of a very methodological approach to ESG reporting. Brian, can, can you share what your company's approach is and you know, from your perspective as the CSA, what, what factors should companies consider or prioritize? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think to echo Kate's comments, it is, it's always evolving. There are so many different ESG disclosing disclosure mechanisms, and it's, it's picking the right ones to, to get your message across and be as transparent as you can. So we at Schnitzer, you know, given that there's so many different types of mechanisms that we can report to and disclose uh, about, um, we try to use a three-factor analysis in deciding which frameworks or questionnaires that we answer in our disclosures, and, and it's really around purpose, audience, and scope. So first, we, we kind of think from a purpose perspective, why are we disclosing? Why are we using this vehicle to, to get our message out? And some, sometimes, you know, with certain frameworks or for certain disclosures, it's really to educate and inform our external stakeholders. Right? It's really a, a more of a data-driven disclosure, a lot of numbers uh, for investors to look at. The other type is more of, are we disclosing to incentivize our own company to do better, uh, to really try to embed and improve sustainable practices within our company? So for example, with CDP, right? So the CDP gives you a grade on climate or water security or supplier engagement. And so I try to use that grade, that feedback that we get to, to continually improve either you know, with, with, our, with our water uh, security grade, we, we made the A list. So we, we made it to the, the top. So now it's really about sustaining that game. So always going back within our business to say, here's, here's the feedback we're getting and here's what we need to do to get better. So really trying to understand the purpose behind why we're disclosing really helps us uh, in the disclosure process. And I think the second one is the audience, right? So there's, there's certain, certain disclosures that are really investor-driven, 
you know, using the GRI framework or, or SASB where the, the investors can, can go and get the data they need to make their determinations on our company. Whereas in our sustainability report, that's, that may be a, a different audience and we need to tailor our answers in a way, uh, our narrative in a way that engages our employees, shows them how their value in the ESG reporting process and becoming a sustainable company. And then finally is the scope. We wanna make sure that we're covering all E, S, and G, not just environmental, right? So like back to the CDP with the climate change questionnaire, that's really environmentally driven. So we wanna make sure we, we report to that, but we also report you know, using the frameworks of SASB and GRI because we wanna have that holistic viewpoint of our business with the E, S, and G. So using those three factors, we're able to kind of pick and choose which, which vehicles we use to disclose.